Luke 23, again, picking it up in verse 50, reading from the New King James Version of the Bible, says this, Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. He had not consented to their decision and deed. He was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And then he took it down. He wrapped it in linen and laid it in a tomb that was hone out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. That day was a day of preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. And then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Church, you may be seated. Let's put up slide number two, all right? What I want to do here is, since we're closing the chapter, chapter 23, I want to give it to you as a whole uh, contextual piece of Scripture. We have broken up this uh, book, this chapter, into five parts. Today we'll start the fifth, and we'll end the, the, the Scripture account here. So all of these are, first of all, listen to me, they are accounts. They are not Bible stories. Sometimes we as adults confuse our children and say, oh, we're going to tell you a little Bible story. And then when the kids turn 15 and, and they start talking, oh, it's just another story. I don't want to hear another story. So for us, let's turn that from stories and share these are accounts. Accounts that happen in history and that the Lord through the Spirit, had him uh, write down for us. So the first is uh, verses 1 to 25, or chapter 23. Jesus had an encounter with Pilate. And so we're going to talk about six encounters. And, and the first one was with Pilate. Pilate, the man that could have, should have, would have, but did not. Could have, would have, should have. He was a man of authority, kind of like some of you who are CEOs or bosses or things like that. You could put yourself in, in Pilate's position. One with authority, Right? This man had Jesus come through his hallways of justice, if you may. And he himself found Jesus innocent. He said, I find no fault in this man. And yet he caved in to the pressure. Again, the man that should have, could have, would have set him free did not set him free because of the populace around him, because of what they were going to say. They threatened him, we'll go to Caesar if you do not condemn this man who calls himself a king. And he probably said, ay, 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 I'm not going to do it. I don't know. But he cowered down, and he set Jesus uh, uh, to the Romans, to the Jews, and they said, crucify him, and he had him crucified. Bad encounter. Bad encounter. So everyday life, you have encounters. Are you letting your light shine for Christ, or are you cowering away? So there's takeaways from these kind of things. Part two, we talked about Jesus' encounter with Simon, a Cyrenian, and the Jerusalem women. The encounter with Simon, Simon had come up from Africa. It was Passover week. Millions of Jews were coming to the city. Simon came from Africa a thousand miles away. He's coming into town. It's nine o'clock in the morning, and they're marching Jesus to Calvary, right? And the guards, the Romans, ask, say, hey, you, come here, pick up the cross and start going. And because uh, Israel and a much part of the world was under Roman rule, they had the right to do that. Well, Simon's thinking, oh, my gosh, I don't even really know him. I'm coming to Passover. I, I know God, who is this guy probably or whatever. But he's finding himself carrying the cross. And so the first part of it, he's probably humiliated. What am I going to tell my kids when I get back home? I came and, and now what? People around the corner are looking at me and they're calling me. that They're thinking that I'm guilty. But it wound up being the best thing that ever happened to Simon's life. The Bible goes on to say that he was a member of the church, <coughs> that his encounter with Jesus, he received and he grew up his family and two of his boys, Rufus, and I believe the other ones, Alexander, wound up being very involved in the church later on. Simon would write to us today, hey man, what started off as a miserable experience wound up being the best part of my life ever, a best part of my life. And throughout my years at the church, people said, Simon, Simon. Would you come and share a word, Simon? Would you take the pulpit? You're the guy that carried Jesus' cross. In humility, he would share. I couldn't believe it, guys. That encounter with Jesus changed my life. The Jerusalem women, there were women who were weeping. They were crying. They're from that city. They're going to stay in that city. And Jesus is looking at them, and he uses it as a teaching moment. and says, women, don't weep for me. 
But days are coming when you will say, blessed are those who, who never gave birth to babies, that never had little families because, and sure enough, 40 years later, or AD 70, Jerusalem, would, a, a siege would be set around them. General Titus would come, and the Jew, Jewish historian uh, Josephus would write, over one million Jews died in that affair. When Jesus was saying, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves because of what's coming down the street, the women who perhaps made it to that age, made it to that time, said, no wonder he said this. And we should have taken the time and reached out to our family members. We should have shared with them about the Lord because look what's happened now. We should have had people turn to Jesus instead of being all religious, you know, because we're dying and they were killed. Over a million people died. We come to our part three. Jesus had an encounter with two criminals. And so we saw Jesus on the cross and a guy on his right, a guy on his left. And these two guys, they're having their encounter and both are listening both are seeing, both are viewing, you answer the phone, and then everybody else is, is going, uh, sorry for the tape or listening on radio, someone's phone just went off, but they're, they're seeing the crowd around Jesus, and they're seeing a religious representation, and so both are seeing the religious guy sneering at Jesus, you're the Christ, you call them father, let him send his angels, or you get down from that cross or whatever. And one of them, his reaction was, yeah, living for the here and now, get us down from the cross, save us, you know, do something like that. But the other guy, so his encounter was just nothing. And Jesus didn't answer this guy. But the other guy, he's looking and he's seeing the sign, king of the Jews, right, in, in both Hebrew and Latin and Greek. And he's looking at his sign, it just says robber, thief, you know. And then he's seeing religious people actually take the time and, and do what they're doing with Jesus. And afar off, he sees friends and acquaintances weeping. This guy thought, especially when he says, you're the king of the Jews. This guy says, listen, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And the Bible says that Jesus turned and looked at him and said, today you will be with me in paradise. Wow, a step of faith. What an encounter for this guy. And now we come to our last part. Jesus and Joseph of Arimathea. But before I do that, I want to just go back into the Jesus' encounter with the Father. I'm sorry, part four. Right? So in our last time together, as Jesus hung on the cross, we learned that darkness was over the whole earth. Jesus, this Father, God the Father, had made his Son, him who knew no sin, to be sin for us. To be sin for us. All the people of the world. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. Again, when we go to heaven, it's not because of what we did, who we did, whatever. It's because one day we accepted Jesus Christ into our heart and we made him our Lord. That's why we go to heaven. We believed in him. The Bible says believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Not you have to do 100 jumping jacks, read the Bible 10 times, do this and that. It doesn't say that. It's just simple faith alone because Jesus took our place. And, and again, how... How, uh, how perfect a day to celebrate communion, to remember what he's done for us. We will never stop sharing communion. As long as I'm alive, we're not going to stop uh, sharing communion or I'm in charge here until they kick me out for being an old man or something. You know, but listen, we do this in remembrance of what he's done for us. He's paid the whole price for us. He's did a great job. So that's why we participate. So anyway, back to this. Uh, Jesus goes to the cross, he takes our place so that we could become the righteousness of God. And, and I shared with you, especially if you're new here or if you're new to Christianity or you haven't heard this before, this was a plan, Jesus dying on the cross, that had been set in motion from eternity past. What that means is, yes, before the earth was ever shaped and planets were put in their place and stars, God the Father, God the Son had a plan. And so when Jesus said, it is finished, on the cross, he's talking about that plan of him giving his life for us. So when this happens, at this time in history, this, this plan was accomplished. So there was darkness over all the earth, which is a physical sign of a spiritual reality. Darkness, separation from God, right? Jesus becomes sin in our place. At the same time, something unheard of happened. 
in the religious community, something unheard of happened, and that was that the veil of the temple was torn in two. <coughs> so for the very first time ever, 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 all could see with their own eyes what was beyond the veil. The holy of holies was now visible. And so what was behind the veil? The seat of mercy, as Pastor Matt was sharing with you. Those curtains were torn from the top to the bottom. And for the first time, people could see. And what did this mean? It was an open house. We all could now approach the Lord without a priest, without lighting a candle, without becoming religious, without being, I better clean up before I go to church. None of that stuff. We could approach the Father. For the very first time, all could see. And so we likened it to that open house. And this miracle announced to the priest and the people that the way into God's presence was now open for all who would come to him by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. So we come by faith to ask and make our petitions made known to the Lord. Right? Then, with a loud voice, a sure voice, Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, Dr. Luke writes, as a doctor, oh, time now, 3 o'clock p.m., he breathed his last. I, as we see in any medical show, you know, when someone dies, what time is it? Doctors are recording the time. They say the time. And so Dr. Luke does that for us as well. He breathed his last. There was a centurion there at the cross. Tough guy. You don't become a centurion, which is in charge of 100 people, century centurion, you know. You, you don't become in charge of 100 guys, soldiers, and then specifically for this detail of crucifying people and putting them out to public if you're a softie. Can't do it. So this is a hard man. And when he saw this, right, he saw this, he had seen, he had seen many men die by crucifixion. He had witnessed a lot of things, right? But never had he witnessed a man like Jesus who died confidently, willingly, and victoriously. Jesus said in a loud voice, it is finished, that whole plan. And the centurion, he's looking at this, oh my gosh. Usually when the guys are dying, they have no words, eh, eh, oh, ah, and they die. But not Jesus, not Jesus. And I shared something with you. I shared that every Christian, if you have made Jesus Lord of your life, then when we are breathing our last breath, we can also say, Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. Kids, I'm out of here. I'll see you on the other side, right? And we die. That's how it should be for us, with that same confidence, because we have Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, right? It really affected him. Never had he ever been uh, personally convicted that a criminal that was put up on the cross was really innocent. He looked at him and he looked at him, nah, these guys are guilty. You know, let them die. But when Jesus came... He couldn't help but cry out, certainly this was a righteous man. And he says that to all the community. All the soldiers are listening. And he says, gosh, boss, what's up? He was a righteous man. You know, and so they're like, man, boss has gone born again or something. I don't know. But that's, that's what's going on. In church, we learned that even the crowd, the looky-loos that just came to, to the site just to see what was going on, to check it out, they began beating their breasts perhaps convicted of their guilt as they left the site. And finally, all his acquaintances, right, and the women who had followed him from Galilee, they stood at a distance watching these things. And with that, we are now ready for the rest of the scripture. Look at verse 50. Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. Church, let's just make a couple of observations here, right? First of all, this is the first time we ever hear of this man called Joseph. And church, Jesus' acquaintance stood at a distance. This is what verse 49 states, right? So they had neither money to acquire the body through the proper channels, right? Nor did they have the courage to bear with the people who despise the Lord. What are you doing? Oh, we want to give him you know, a, a decent burial. This is Jesus. What are, what are you doing? They just crucified him. Why do you want to give him? So these guys, everybody's scared. That's why they're far off, right? They're afraid of what, what stigma is going to be attached to them, right? They didn't have that courage. But 
Ha, huh, check it out, right? They wanted to give him a decent burial. They couldn't. They didn't have the money to approach Pilate, as I said. But God raised up one who had both the money and the integrity to go before Pilate. This man's name was Joseph of Arimathea. And you and I would have seen this guy because part of the Sanhedrin, we'll talk about it in a second, and you said, you would, I would have never thought this guy was a Christian. I would have never thought this guy believed the way we do. And sometimes this is you at work. This is you when someone's picking on someone or doing or right about to do something wrong, and you don't open your mouth, or maybe you open your mouth, but you're kind of like little, you know, just a little bit afraid, and all of a sudden this manager-type guy guy that has both the integrity and everything else steps up and says, no, this is wrong. We're not going to do this. And you take strength from a man like this. This is Joseph of Arimathea. Who would have known that God, for such a time as this, had this fellow there named Joseph? Second observation. His character was that the Bible says that he was good and just. Now here's a little sidebar for us. Lord, help us to be good and just. Because we are not good and just people all the time. If you're not preparing, if you're not asking the Lord, Lord, help me in any situation to do the right thing. Lord, if another thing comes up at work, help me to do the right thing. And if, if I'm ever like an HR manager and I have to make a decision, this and that, I don't care what everybody else is saying, Lord. What is the just thing to do? You've given me the power to, to say he has the job, you know, maybe to suspend someone for two weeks but keep him in the workplace. Lord, help me to be just. This man, the Bible says, was good and just. So as a sight, and he's not saying that about himself. It's others. Dr. Luke is writing this down. Therefore, may it be said about us that we are also good and just. Especially this man. He was good and just to those who needed him. Third observation. He was a person of quality. A quality. The Bible says he was a counselor a member of the Sanhedrin. So he's one of the elders of the Jewish community. Hmm, quite a man. First part of verse 51 says, he had not consented to their decision and deed. Whoa, is it important for Luke to put that down? Dr. Luke writes a note here. He had not consented to their decision and deed. Church, Dr. Luke notes this. Because though Joseph was part of that body of men who had put Christ to death, yet he, talking about Joseph, had not consented to their decision and deed. Though it was carried out by the majority, by the majority, yet he entered his protest against it, not following the multitude to do evil. This is interesting. When you're reading Mark's gospel, I believe it is, Mark says that all consented. And that's probably the way it sounded. How many of you guys think we ought to kill Jesus? Arr! You know, there's the roar. But he, the Bible says, did not. <coughs> well, why is this important for us? Why do you think there's such a note like this? Let's put up slide number three. Here's something for us. This is truth for us. Evil counsel or deed to which we have not consented shall not be reckoned our act. Our act. That means you might be in a meeting. You might be all the bosses of Ford or the bosses of GM or the bosses of, you know, Russell Stovers or whatever. And in the ma management decision is saying, we're going to have to lay off all these guys. And you're saying, really? Right at Christmas time? Come on, guys. Let's not do it at Christmas time. Well, you know, we're having a vote and this is what we're going to do. And, and that's just the way it is. But because you said no and even in the picture, here comes Montrose Daily Press. They have everybody's picture. They, the bosses, said they were going to lay off everybody at Montrose, Russell Stover's, right? You might be in that picture, but guess what? God will not hold it against you. That is the truth for you. But what did he do? He spoke up. You have to share. You have to speak up, right? Even if the whole, let's just say you're in a gang, right? Hopefully not. But I remember, you know, back even in 8th and ninth grade, Stevenson Junior High School in East L.A., right? They're picking on this guy. He had just come over, or we, we called them TJs, right? Second generation Hispanic. We'll look at a first generation guy that can't even pronounce whatever, right? And we picked on them. 
And you got to remember, 99.9% .9 of the school is Hispanics. It's all Hispanics, right? We have a huero or two. Huero means what? White guy, right? Or, or whatever. So we have one or two there, but most of them are Hispanics, right? And so here comes this brand new family, what we call FOB, fresh off the boat, right? And that was for our Asian friends, but really for the Hispanic guy, he crossed the border and he, he you know, everybody's going to pick on him. So I remember they had him in the corner and there was, you know, dumb gangs, Satan slaves, Vikings, Shroud of Cords, Body and Nuevo, all these crazy guys, right? And they get this guy. And he had just been introduced to our homeroom in the morning, right? But here's this gang, I have him against the corner, and they're going to beat him up. That's just the way it was. Welcome to the USA, right? And this one guy, as they're coming in, we know what's going to happen, right? This one guy says, hey, 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 leave him alone. And we're, like, ah, we're going to, uh, we always do this. It's part of the, you know, his initiation or whatever. Guy says, leave him alone, right? And everybody, ah, bell rings, saved by the bell type thing, and the guy's free. Right? There always has to be that one guy that even if you're part of that crowd, you know, people know you for something else. We're part of this world. We rub shoulders with the world. In our workplace, at school, wherever we're at, we're part of the world. But may it be from you that you are not the world in these kind of situations. That you do what is right and just before the Lord. Because it will not be held against you. No matter what goes down from there. Have to be that person. May God grant us to be that. So once again, truth for us, evil counsel or deed to which we have not consented shall not be reckoned our act. Second part of verse 51, look at your Bible. This guy, he was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. So what's that telling you? Luke felt a kinship with this guy. Dr. <coughs> Excuse me, Dr. Luke found him. He's one of us. Now, if you go and look in your trivia, uh, Google, where's Arimathea? It just says it's the city of the Jews. So it could be like a Bethlehem, you know, five miles outside, two miles outside the city. But it's just an area, and it was populated by the Jews. But this guy, he was waiting for the kingdom of God. So from this scripture, we learn and understand that he too, right, right not only he too believed in the Old Testament prophecies. And he expected the accomplishment of them. I say that to say this, there are, I don't know what it is with Christendom. I don't know what's happening to us. I just don't know as a whole, Christendom as a whole. But there are part of Christendom, part people that are Christians who tell you, who would share with you, don't pay attention or put any more value in the Old Testament. We are New Testament believers and you don't have to worry about the past. You don't have to read all the names, what happened in Deuteronomy and Exodus Big deal. Just focus on the new. May I say to you, when you hear that from them, just pray for these guys. We need the Old Testament. It is a strong foundation for everything we have. We could not embrace Jesus that he came from a virgin birth if it wasn't prophesied by the guys in the OT, in the Old Testament. The Lord had said a delivery would come. He starts off in Genesis 3 when the fall takes place. There will be one that will come, Right? Always looking forward to Messiah. This guy was such a guy. And you and I should be the same. We should revere the Old Testament. We should embrace it for it's a part of our foundation. We thank the Lord for his mercy and grace. These poor guys in the back. Sorry, fellows. You have to bring Bessie the cow. No communion. And by the way, Matt, they're not crackers. It's bread. Freshly made bread for you guys. But anyway, my son-in-law is the same way. Jared, he used to say, hey, come and get the cracker and juice. Aye, that hurts me. Where did these guys miss something? Not man, but uh, these guys. But this, this bread that we have for communion, how many kind of enjoy it? It's kind of nice. Is it meant to enjoy, like just for the taste? No, right? It reminds you of what the body of the Lord went through. Jesus died for our sins. It's, it's a heavy thing. But thank the Lord that we don't have to punish ourselves. Like, mm, 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 my crackers from 10 years ago, you know. I'm appreciative to the Lord for what he does for us. Anyway, back to this, right? Where was I? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, listen, guys like Joseph of Arimathea, we don't know where all of a sudden he pops up. He's doing these things. I praise the Lord today for people, men and women, who don't seem to have an outside appearance uh, of being part of the family of Christ. 
But I praise the Lord that when the occasion calls for it, all of a sudden the occasion calls for them, that there they are, <coughs> showing their respect for Jesus Christ. Surprise. This Joseph, of all people, a Sanhedrin member, right, is the one that's going to go before Pilate. So 52. This man went to Pilate, and he asked for the body of Jesus. Wow. I like this on Dr. Luke because he kind of sizes it up, as we say, right? This man, Joseph, right? He's saying, this guy's a man. He's not only content, he's, he's very heartbroken with what's happened. He didn't consent to it, but he's going to man up, and he's going to go before Pilate. That takes guts to do that. Before the governor, the judge that condemned Jesus, he's going to go up to him, and he's going to ask for the body of Jesus, Right? He's going to, some of the guys say, well, you know, I couldn't do it because I don't know how to speak to people in authority. I don't have the vocabulary. I don't have this and that. Well, learn, right? Every once in a while, the best book of education that you could ever read is the Bible. You know, you start pronouncing some of these names, you'll be able to pronounce anti-disestablishmentarianism and supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. You'll be able to pronounce all that junk because you studied your Bible. Your Bible prepares you how to speak. The Bible reminds you, and God's Spirit, who makes the Bible come alive in you, will give you the intelligence of what to use now in your tone and everything else. Your Bible is a living book, the living Word of God, powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, it says. Joseph had the Word, and he's going up to Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus. So Dr. Luke says, says this man, Joseph... So he informs us that he went to Pilate, the judge that condemned him, and asked and received, not only asked, but he received permission to take the body. And guess what? He did this peacefully as befitting a man of honor. In other words, Joseph could have seen the crowd, seen people are heard, come on, let's go take the body by force, and la, la, la. No, he didn't do that. He said, there's a right way and a wrong way. I'm going to go and ask. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. And he goes, and he presents himself before Pilate, and he receives the body. 53, look at your Bible. Then he took it down. He wrapped it in linen and laid it in a tomb, <coughs> excuse me, that was honed out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. Church, that he took it down means he handled it with his hands. We are informed in the Gospel of John. Chapter 19, verse 38 through 42, that Nicodemus, remember Nicodemus, also part of the Sanhedrin? The word was out, don't you affiliate with Jesus? So at night he comes and he asks Jesus these questions, how can a man be born again and all these things? The Bible informs us that he came, uh, he was there. And so the two of them, between the two of them, they took down the body. Now imagine that. If it was just Joseph, the cross is set up, Jesus is off the ground. Right? His feet are across. There's a nail holding it, and nails holding his hands. How are you going to take that body down? Be practicable, practical, be reasonable. How are you going to do it down? So how neat that there's the other guy hanging out. There's the other guy, Nicodemus. And so Nicodemus and Joseph are the ones that get up and somehow remove the nail or get his hand through it. Maybe it was already coming through. There's holes in his hands, Right? However they did it, I don't think they went with, oh, give me that number two hammer and put it on the board. And, you know, I don't think they did that. I mean, think about it. How are they going to get him off the cross? The weight, both of them bring him down with their hands. So they're touching blood. They're bringing him as he probably comes over. I got him. I got him. All right, come on. You know, and the Bible says that they wrapped him in cloth, right? Clean, cleaned him, had to clean themselves. What forethought? Are you thinking that far ahead? Are you thinking in the future how you're going to serve the Lord? Are you making preparations? Should he need class? Should he need this or that? Are you the one that's going to respond with this? Joseph was thinking, it's, it's late. The, 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 the Sabbath is coming. This is a day of preparation. We have to get things done. As soon as that sun goes down, you can't do anything in the Jewish culture, right? And so these guys... Did do that. They took the body down, they washed it, they wrapped it in linen, and they transported it to a tomb that had belonged to Joseph again of Arimathea. What a guy. 
Now think about this. They wouldn't have time to shop for these things, so these guys, perhaps after they receive permission, I don't know, pick up something on the run, <coughs> on the fly, I don't know. I think they thought about it. When they laid Jesus into the new tomb, they fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy. Once again, Old Testament scripture being fulfilled. It's chapter 53, verse 9. Let's put a slide number four. Talk about prophecy being fulfilled. The Bible says, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Isaiah 53, 9. Church, by taking down the body of Jesus and laying it in a tomb, Joseph and Nicodemus kept the Romans from, this is what the Romans used to do. They kept the Romans from discarding his body on the garbage dump outside of the city. You see, condemned criminals lost the right to proper burial. But God saw to it that his son's body was buried with dignity and with love. It was important, important that the body be buried properly. For God would raise Jesus from the dead. And if there were any doubt about his death or burial, that could affect, that could affect the message of, in the ministry of the gospel, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. So, verse 54, look at your Bible. But before we do that, another thing about Joseph of Arimathea. So he's a good man, he's a just man, especially to those that have a need. You could be good and just to your peer group, to those that you associate with, that's, that's something, and that's good that you are. But to the ones that come that have a need, it takes attention. It'll take your time. You have to meet their, if you're there to meet their need, it, you have to have that heart for it. God has to prepare your heart for it, or you won't meet those needs. It's okay to run with the people you run with, but when there's a need from someone else that you don't have any ties with, that's the challenge. And this is how Joseph was. That he gave him his tomb... <coughs> a, a place out of a, a home rock. So if this is a wall, someone took the time, someone paid the money to make this into a tomb. How many of you guys have used masons before? And now answer me the truth. Are they cheap or expensive? Expensive. Expensive. Even if, if you're laying brick down by the board foot, or by, by, you know, you're, you're, it's still three bucks Four bucks a foot used to be, I don't know what it is. Now, if you're going up, that's something. But you use these guys to chisel, that's an expensive place. Probably a year, year and a half project before. And yet his heart was moved because of who Jesus was to give him the tomb, to lay in the tomb. You might say, well, it's no sacrifice for a rich man. Oh, yes, it is. It's the rich who count their pennies. That's why they don't pay you too much or they wouldn't be rich. You know, so that's why they have it, right? Because they, they've taken care of it. But to give it away, it's a heart move. It's a conviction for the Lord. And that's what he did. So again, 54, the day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. So church, this happened on a Friday, the day of preparation. When it says that the Sabbath drew near, we must remember that the Jewish Sabbath begins on Friday at sunset. So it's been over a day now. Jesus on Thursday night was taken from the garden, right? Judas betrayed him all night at the chief priest's house that whole day. At 9 o'clock in the morning the next day, they had him on the cross, right? And here it is, before sun going down, he's down from the cross, holiday Saturday, he rises month, Sunday. Now, this is why there was such a rush, though, with the funeral, because the Sabbath. Their attendance, the people's attendance, the ladies, the women, the men, their attendance was required at home, and there was work to do in preparation of it, in preparation of the Sabbath. Church, the fourth commandment reads, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. That Sabbath is when we take a time out out of your week and you think about the Lord and what he's done for you and your future as well. The days have moved for us because Jesus arose on a Sunday. But the, the mentality of it, that we dedicate this time, this is what you're doing right now. You are opening your Bible. You are listening to someone preach the gospel or share the word of God. This is what they were supposed to do back then. Nothing takes the place of this. Therefore, we coordinate our activities around the time of the Lord. First day of the week, first day that we give to the Lord. First fruits, always for the Lord, right? 
So, we remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. For us, Sunday, we do this and we come together. Now, don't misunderstand this because everything's a rush for them to get the body down to put it in the tomb. Yes, there were tears for the death of the Lord. Yet, they had to apply themselves in preparation for the Sabbath. Listen, I don't want you to come to start thinking, oh man, Pastor Ben is insensitive. When Pastor Ben uh, doesn't have the heart for someone that's passed away. Pastor Ben, this and that. Listen for you. This is for you, right? For us today, we too, just as they were affected by a loved one's death or a tragedy that takes place. However, their death, as in back then, Jesus' death, the death of our friends today or loved ones today, should not be our death. Our affairs must be so taken care of that they do not hinder us from the work that God has called us to. We who are alive must carry on what the Lord's put in our hearts and in our lives to do. We have to. 55, verse 55, look at your Bible. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. <coughs> Church, if they had printed bulletins of the funeral back then, most people would have been shocked that not one of the disciples were there. Aren't you shocked? Now, now here's the picture again. Jesus has died. They've broken the legs of the other thieves. The Romans, they're, they're, everything, it's over with, right? They're gone. Joseph comes, he has permission. So why are the guys still not there? Would have been shocked. If you read the bulletin, the ladies are there from Galilee, this and that. Uh, there's no Peter, James, and John around. What's going on? Not one of the guys was there at this funeral. But no, who was there again? The women who had come to with him from Galilee. These same women, out of affection for the Lord, followed after Joseph and Nicodemus and observed the tomb and how his body was laid. So, guys, we can't say, well, you know, it's a women thing. They watch Hallmark, so it's only them that are there. Well, that's not true. Joseph is there. Nicodemus is there. And I must confess to you, I watch Hallmark, I eat popcorn, and I use tissues. Okay, just thought I'd let you know. All right, moving on, 56. <coughs> Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandments. I want to make two observations as we come to a close of this chapter. The first one is regarding these women. By returning to prepare spices and fragrant oil, this really was more evidence of their affection than their faith. Than their faith, okay? For had they remembered... Had they believed what Jesus had often said, that he would rise on the third day, they would have spared themselves all this rush and all these expenses, right? Their cost and effort as knowing that in a very short time, there would be a greater honor placed upon his body, that of the glory of the resurrection. Nevertheless, nevertheless, they rested on the Sabbath, as the Bible says here, according to the commandments. Praise the Lord for that. Our second observation is that of Joseph of Arimathea. The late Bible commentator William McDonnell writes, quote, in burying the body of Jesus, Joseph also buried himself, in a sense. The act separated him forever from the nation that crucified the Lord of life and glory. He would never be a part of Judaism again, but would live in moral separation from it and testify against it, end quote. So true. So true. He would be spurned by the consul. History, if you're a Google type guy and you check out histories, I, I should have put a picture up for your artist rendition. Next time I do something like this, perhaps I will. But history informs us that in A.D. 61, Philip sent Joseph of Arimathea to England. So it is highly possible that one who gave up his position uh, on the Sanhedrin and his standing in the community in order to bury Jesus <coughs> did, indeed, did indeed take the gospel message to England. As we close, G 
Joseph of Arimathea died sometime. How many of you guys know that? Everybody dies, right? So he died, right? And I would say that the first words that Joseph heard on the other side of this life was Jesus' words saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my rest. And I got to tell you, I got to tell you, I think all of us should aim to hear those words from the Lord. Contrast to that is that there's a lot of us, praise the Lord, that have believed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and yes, they are saved. And so when they die, Jesus' words, perhaps to them, first words they're going to hear is, hey, come on in. You believed. That's a good thing. Amen? Is that not a good thing? You're not going the other way. Dude, you smell like toast. You're out of here. It's not nothing like that, right? It's a good thing. And I wonder, just I just wonder if we will hear, well done, because you did something. Because you stood good and just and helped out someone in his name. Because you made a decision for the Lord. I don't care if I lose my position. I don't care if no one talks to me again. This is the right thing to do before the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to stand in. I'm going to do the right thing because I want to hear the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. May that be your prayer. May that be your result, resolve to plan to end your life well for the Lord, that he might say that to you. Let's bow our heads and close in prayer. Father God, Holy Spirit, you're amazing to make the scripture alive for us understandable for us that we might now look back in admiration of guys like Joseph of Arimathea, Lord. People who don't have all the limelight like the apostles do, Lord, but man, Lord, you use guys from all walks of life. And this one, Lord, special guy, Lord, a just man, a man with title, Lord, you use them, Lord, to honor your son, Jesus. Help us, Lord, to do what you put in our hearts and in our lives to do, that, it, that you might say of us, well done, good and faithful servant. Help us, Lord, to do this. In Jesus' name, amen.